Ti-6-4 accounts for most of the titanium additive manufacturing research published over the last decade or so. But there are many other readily available comparable titanium alloy wires and powders that don't gain such attention. We looked at using one such alloy, Ti-6242, with a high deposition rate additive manufacturing process called wire arc additive manufacturing. But before I get to that, let's look at the two alloys in question, Ti-6-4 and Ti-6242. Ti-6-4, which is titanium with 6 weight percent aluminium and 4 vanadium, achieves its high strength through manipulation of its two-phase nature. Above around 980 degrees Celsius, the beta transverse temperature, the metal contains one phase, the body-centered cubic beta phase. When cooling below 980 C, the beta phase begins to transform to the hexagonal close-packed alpha phase. And once room temperature is reached, the microstructure consists of small acicular alpha laths separated by a thin layer of beta phase when viewed from a 2D cross-section. It is from this fine microstructural scale that Ti-6-4 gains its superior strength and which also contributes to its other excellent mechanical properties. Furthermore, the mechanical property balance can be customised by controlling the cooling rate during solidification or, as is more often the case, the subsequent thermomechanical processing. For example, a fast cooling rate can produce a very fine microstructure that results in high strength and reduced ductility, but ductility can be improved by coarsening the microstructure with an appropriate heat treatment while sacrificing strength. Ti-6-4 occupies a region on the alpha-beta phase stability scale often referred to as alpha plus beta alloys. That is, the titanium is alloyed with elements that stabilise either alpha or beta phases and the balance of these leads to a certain fraction of each phase existing at room temperature under a certain set of processing conditions. For Ti-6-4, these fractions are usually around 10% beta and 90% alpha. This phase stability is usually measured in terms of an alloy's molybdenum equivalence, but I won't go into the details of this measure here. More alpha stabilised alloys, like commercially pure titanium, are generally used for corrosion critical applications, and heavily beta stabilised alloys can exhibit very high strengths, but sacrifice ductility as a result and are relatively dense. There are other titanium alloys with similar phase stability to Ti-6-4, so many can exhibit similar properties to Ti-6-4 if processed correctly. One such alloy is Ti-6242, which is titanium with 6 weight percent aluminium, 2 tin, 4 zirconium, 2 molybdenum and a pinch of silicon. Ti-6242 is often referred to as a near alpha alloy. Although I personally have some reservations about including Ti-6242 in this class due to its similarity to Ti-6-4. Ti-6242 has comparable ambient mechanical properties to Ti-6-4, but it was primarily designed for superior high temperature capabilities. For example, for jet engine compressor blades that operate up to 550 degrees Celsius. While thermomechanical processing routes for both wrought alloys are similar, their compositions are very different. First, the vanadium in Ti-6-4 is replaced by molybdenum in Ti-6242 for beta phase stabilisation. This serves several purposes. Molybdenum is a slower diffusing element species than vanadium, which improves creep and oxidation resistance at high temperature, and the concentration of molybdenum is controlled in Ti-6242 so that less of the soft beta phase is present at high temperature to help boost tensile strength. Silicon is added to promote the formation of silicide particles at alpha lath boundaries that also help resist creep. Finally, both tin and zirconium are added as solid solution strengtheners to help compensate for the drop in strength of titanium alloys at elevated temperatures. However, no commercially available titanium alloy wires or powders are designed for additive manufacturing. They are only designed for conventional casting and wrought processes. So differing alloying elements in two commercial alloys can make a huge difference in deposited material during 3D printing since they're not designed for the rapid cooling during solidification and subsequent thermal cycling in additive manufacturing 
which is especially true for high deposition rate additive manufacturing processes designed to produce large aerospace components. In the paper we published recently, through the new WAM project, we directly compared the as-deposited microstructures of TIE-64 and TIE 6242 built with high deposition rate wire arc additive manufacturing, or WAM, and discussed the implications this has on AM alloy selection. First, let's look at the 6242 WAM deposit. From this optical macrograph of an etched TIE-6242 sample, you can see the heterogeneous heat-affected zone, or has bands, as well as the fusion boundary bands. But more importantly, you can see the enormous columnar beta phase grains that span many deposited layers and cover much of the build height. These heavily textured columnar beta grains are well documented for Ti-6-4 in the literature and are known to cause mechanical anisotropy and unreliable damage tolerance. Not exactly ideal for safety critical aerospace components. However, fortunately, we can employ prevention measures. The application of interpass machine hammer peening, where peening is employed on top of each deposited layer when the material is relatively cold, refines the beta grain size. The electron backscatter diffraction, or EBSD, orientation maps here show the beta phase structure before cooling through the beta transus for TIE 6242 single wire bead WAM walls where interpass peening was applied. These maps are shown in inverse pole figure colouring, which we use to quantify texture, the tendency for the metal crystal orientations to align in a particular direction. Put simply, the more varied the colours in a map, the more varied the crystal orientations, the weaker the texture, and the more isotropic the component mechanical properties. Clearly, reducing the grain size with peening weakens the texture in TIE 6242 WAM components. Let's look at the transformation microstructures now. Using the Batscatter electron detector in the scanning electron microscope, which can detect atomic weight differences, we can resolve the alpha and beta phases in titanium alloys. The alpha stabilizers, mainly aluminium for TIE 6242, and beta stabilizer, the molybdenum, diffuse to their respective phases. And since molybdenum is a heavier element than aluminium, the beta phase appears brighter in the backscatter electron detector than the alpha phase. In the micrograph here, you can clearly see the acicular alpha phase laths separated by fine layers of beta. This type of interwoven structure, achieved with relatively high cooling rates through the beta transus, is often referred to as a basket weave structure in titanium alloys. However, the microstructure is not consistent throughout the TIE 6242 WAM component. The layer height is relatively large in WAM components. This means the thermal cycling produced by repeated wire depositions reheats the substrate heterogeneously in the build height direction, resulting in the has-bands we saw in the optical macrograph earlier. The has-bands consist of basket weave that has a variable alpha laugh thickness and chemical segregation, hence why it shows up in the optical images. We can readily quantify the alpha lath thickness using lines of sequential micrograph tiles across the WAM sample build height and a bespoke program. And it produces a graph like this. The alpha lath thickness is plotted on the y-axis, that is, the minor axis of each lath, and the distance in the sample build height direction is plotted on the x-axis. The thermal cycling across each of the layers produces a sawtooth wave pattern across most of the sample, where there is a gradual increase in the lath thickness across the hasband, and there is a sudden drop at the top of the hasband. This is a result of the effect of thermal cycling close to the beta transus and will not be discussed here because it is included in our paper. At the top of the TIE 6242 WAM wall, above 60 millimeters in this graph, the material is only heated above the beta transus, so the alpha lath thickness is purely controlled by the cooling rate, which remains near constant. Now let's compare to TIE 64. To do this, we deposited TIE 6242 on top of TIE 64 by switching the wire feed halfway through the WAM build, with some of the wall interpass peened and some of it not. This way, we had TIE64 and TIE6242 material 
with Colima and Equiax beta grains, 3D printed under exactly the same conditions for direct comparison. Let's take a look at the unpeened material first. In the top optical macrograph of the etched TIE 64 to TIE 6242 sample, again we see the columnar grains that are pervasive throughout the material in both alloys, as well as the has and fusion boundary bands. We tracked the material composition throughout the sample using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, or EDS for short, and you can see there isn't a sharp change from TIE 64 to TIE 6242. Instead, there is an alloy alloy transition region spanning approximately 4 millimeters, which is about 4 wire layers, which exhibit a step change in composition until the nominal TIE 6242 composition is reached. This is a result of the large substrate remelt depth and alloy mixing that occurs in process with WAM. If we look at the alpha lath thickness throughout the TIE 64 going into the TIE 6242 sample, we see the same sawtooth wave pattern spanning both alloys, where the alloy switch and transition region has been tracked here using the zirconium EDS signal. However, you'll notice that the average lath thickness drops throughout the transition region into the TIE 6242, where it becomes, overall, 25% smaller. In addition, you'll notice the variability across the sawtooth wave pattern in the TIE 6242 reduces. The most likely explanation for this is the presence of slower diffusing molybdenum in the TIE 6242. The alpha lath coarsening that occurs during thermal cycling close to the beta transus is a diffusion based process and if diffusion is slower, less lath growth occurs. The faster diffusing vanadium in TIE 64 allows an overall quicker lath growth rate. If we now look at the beta grain sizes in the TIE 64 to TIE 6242 interpass peened sample, we have a similar story. The beta grain size drops by 25% across the alloy alloy mixing region, which again can be explained by retarded growth due to slow diffusing molybdenum in the TIE 6242, which is a known effect. So, the TIE 6242 beta grain and transformation microstructure is overall much more refined than in TIE 64. And this is due to the difference in alloying elements that alters the microstructure coarsening rate during thermal cycling. What does this mean? Well, first, the finer microstructure in the TIE 6242 would likely result in a higher tensile strength possible than in the TIE 64 under the same AM build conditions. And since strength can be traded for ductility with post-build heat treatments, the TIE 6242 would have a larger range of property tailoring for components than TIE 64, which, with AM, you can achieve in the same component if you're clever about it. Next, the smaller the beta grain size, the weaker the texture of the transformation microstructure, and the more isotropic the mechanical properties become which is especially important when your beta grains can grow millimetres in size. So, TIE 6242 should behave more isotropically than TIE 64, which is key in complex loading scenarios. Third, superior damage tolerance can be obtained by beta annealing alpha plus beta titanium alloys, which can also eradicate the has-band heterogeneities in AM components. However, Beta annealing causes significant beta grain growth in TIE 64, as shown here, but due to the slower diffusing molybdenum in TIE 6242, this growth is hindered, and so more mechanical isotropy should be maintained. Additionally, the slow cooling rates necessary for beta annealing larger components will produce a smaller alpha lath size in TIE 6242 than in TIE 64. So TIE 6042 should retain more tensile strength than TIE 64 after beta annealing heat treatments. Finally, let's not forget that TIE 6242 is designed for high temperature applications while TIE 64 is not. However, TIE 6242 WAM may need to be heat treated correctly to maximize these benefits. So, is TIE 6242 more suited than TIE 64 for use in additive manufacturing? It would appear so, but we've yet to prove that conclusively. Perhaps there's an even better readily available alloy for high deposition rate additive manufacturing. Perhaps 
We should be designing AM-specific alloys. Seems like we've got a lot of work to do.